Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the Internet Personality of S Hair. And you remember the summer of Hellraiser? That was a lot of fun. Unless you like your horror franchises to actually get better over time. But the series has a chance to redeem itself with the ninth movie in the franchise, Hellraiser Judgment. Released February of this year, Hellraiser Judgment was written and directed by Gary J. Tunnicliffe, who has written for the series before, doing the shorts Hellraiser Prophecy and Hellraiser Debtor Writer's Lament. He also wrote the screenplay for Hellraiser Revelations. Dear God, could I at least make it through the introduction without putting a handprint on my face? Now, on the plus side, Judgment looks like it's not going to be as bad as that ungodly abomination, and it follows the story of a serial killer on the loose. Detectives work to solve the case, as the murderer picks off victims based on sins they have committed. Also, there's something in the back involving Cenobites and shit somewhere. I have the feeling that if Dimension Films could release a movie without Cenobites in it and just call it Hellraiser, they would. Anyway, let's take a look at Hellraiser Judgment and give my judgment on this Hellraiser. We open to the Lament configuration and Pinhead lamenting how people just don't go for it anymore because they could just play Nintendo Switch instead. The house is ready, we can adapt. Technology may have advanced, but sin remains unchanged. Sin? Sir? Mr. Cotonicliffe? Cenobites aren't evil. They... they really fuck you up, but only consensually. First big thing for me to bitch and moan about, Cenobites are effectively demons. They're evil and forces of hell, and I hope you aren't watching this movie because you actually like the Hellraiser series and lore. Point is, fuck the puzzle box. The Cenobites' new method for tempting victims to their world, such as Carl Watkins here, played by Jeff Fenter, is the Postal Service. A simple letter telling him that they can help him, so please come, is all it takes for him to arrive, only to get the shit kicked out of him and awaken tied to a chair. What are you doing to me? Yes, all, all valid questions. What the fuck is going on? Mr. Watkins, please, please assist your situation. You received a mysterious letter, arrived at an old dark house, and now tied to a chair. Not only that, it's the beginning of a movie, so you know shit is not going to go well. The Cenobite he's speaking with would be the auditor, played by our writer and director himself, Gary J. Tunicliffe. Jesus Christ. Heavens, no. Same city, completely different zip code. And he's actually not a terrible actor. Matter of fact, the auditor is one of the high points of this movie. With a design based on a reimagined pinhead from a Hellraiser reboot idea that got kicked around, the auditor doesn't torture his victims through blades or hooks or other such horrors, but through very invasive, uncomfortable lines of questioning. August 18th, 2001, you lured little Courtney Redlifts into your car. Why? I was just trying to figure out if my child repellent spray was working properly. As it turns out, I'm actually the victim of an eBay scam. The way this works is the auditor gets his confessions and all the horrifying details typed out in the man's blood, going over each and every dark sin they've perpetrated over their lives. And then... First of all, you will meet with the assessor. He will look over your pages, pass on his findings to the jury, and we'll go from there. We go to the harshest trial of all, where you bring you before the terrifying presence of Judge Judy. First things first, though, his pages have to go through the assessor, played by John Gulliger. He's brought a little something to help digest them while he's at it. Tears of children. Ooh, so edgy. This turns out to be a garnish, as the assessor takes Reader's Digest very literally and consumes the- Okay, that's enough of that. Ah, I forgot to mention, this movie seems to specialize in... Gross out horror. Yay. I already had to sit through that, I don't need to put you through it too. Unfortunately, I do have to say how this process works, so after he eats up the sins, he barfs them up. Again, gross at her that spends more than enough time showing all the little intricate details of the regurgitation process. Which is then sent to the jury. The jury that consists of three women in matching black thongs with no clothing. Or skin on their faces who run their fingers through the barf in an extreme close-up because, hey, in case you didn't notice, this is gross at her. Exclusively. Ladies, your verdict. Guilty. Of? It's kind of pointless to have a verdict without a charge, ladies. You'll be taken from here to be cleaned and then to the surgeon. What about my reward? Your note said you understood. It said you were a friend. Yeah, and it said fuck all about a reward. Bit of an oversight there. The dirty, crumpled note written in blood didn't exactly give off the biggest publisher's clearinghouse vibe. There's that cleansing they talked about, though, which is an odd beast. Looks like it tries to combine the gross-out horror with erotic horror. 
the results are just as confusing and pointless as you could expect. But it's a Hellraiser movie, see? There's Pinhead! Wouldn't have Pinhead in it if it wasn't a Hellraiser movie. Once his cleansing is complete, all the ladies having ripped off his clothes and licked him clean, the next one to arrive is the Butcher, played by Joel Decker. Not sure if he's supposed to be a Cenobite, considering the costume looks nothing like a Cenobite. It looks like what you'd expect from an artist who didn't look up Cenobites, but Silent Hill or The Hills Have Eyes for inspiration. Also, the Butcher doesn't do shit, he just is a taxi service for the real punishment. The Surgeon, played by Gillian Blundell. So they kill him. Yay? It's kind of underwhelming for a Hellraiser movie. Also makes that whole trial shit they went through feel a lot like filler, and I really don't want all that gross-out shit I had to endure be nothing but fucking filler. I mean, they keep mutilating the body, they peel his skin off, but it's not like there's any kind of reasoning behind it. It's just more gross-out horror at this point, which is mixed again with the erotic horror as the ladies get his blood splattered on their boobage because that's how the storyboards went. Now that this is over with, you can completely forget about that entire event! Some of the characters will be important later, but none of the disgusting shit we had to endure has any effect on the plot whatsoever moving forward. Jumping into the events that actually matter, we meet Crystal Lanning, played by Grace Monty, coming home drunk from a night on the town. As she finds her apartment has apparently been broken into by someone who has cut the power and filled the place with candles, naturally she thinks this is an ex who she is more than willing to fuck right here and now. But there is one thing that is just too weird for even her. Where's my dog, baby? You check the bathroom? Maybe he snuck in there while you were getting ready. You closed the door behind him and forgot to check. Unfortunately for her, she doesn't find any helpful hints in the shadows. Only a punch to the face! What do you want? To make a lesson out of you. How to effectively use sound effects and well-timed cuts to convey impact in cinema. Thus, we can be introduced to the real stars of this movie, a pair of brothers slash detective partners, David and Sean Carter, played by Randy Wayne and Damon Carney, respectively. David's the prim and proper good cop, while Sean is the gruff and dirty cop who does what he has to do to get the job done. Not to say that he's a one-note stereotype, mind you. It's the most popular fictional book on the planet. So why is this crystal chick like the book? Read it. He's also well-versed in literature and way too stuck up to actually help anyone in that regard. They're working under the assumption that this particular murder is the work of a serial killer known as the Perceptor, whose grisly acts are framed as punishments for the sins of his victims. Doesn't this seem a bit basic for the Perceptor? The fuck are you? What are you doing creeping around a murder scene at night time? You wanna end up dead? I understand being cautious, but perhaps the badge on her hip is an indication you should cut back on being complete assholes just a smidge. This would be Christine Edgerton, played by Alexandra Harris. She's also been assigned to this case, and shows up randomly out of the shadows because that's just how you do it in movies. Nevertheless, she has insights that the guys have been lacking thus far. I was under the impression that he liked to shock, appall, teach. And that? I am a jealous god, thou shalt have no others unto me? I, I did kind of skip over that part. For context, this was playing on a loop when they arrived at the apartment. I worship this little guy. So from this, we learn that the Perceptor has no fucking idea what hyperbole is. You think she literally worships her dog there like, Yeah, fuck God, I got dog here. This isn't even a hard one to find a match for. All you gotta do is pick literally anyone in the world who is not of an Abrahamic faith. The other part of the Perceptor's calling card, though, is his penchant for gross-out horror. Don't worry, though. It turns out they have to work fast to tear open the victim's abdomen because the monster stuffed her pet in there. Baby. The dog was her baby. So we put it into her womb. Oh, who gives a fuck about that? Anyone gonna bother to tell me how the hell the thing managed to survive in there? I don't see a rebreather strapped to its muzzle. Also, here's a lament configuration just to remind you it's a Hellraiser movie. Back with the investigation, we see it's not just the piles of evidence that the Scepter left in his wake the guys are having trouble with, but all this working means that Sean ends up coming home late. Today of all days, the birthday of his wife, Allison, played by Regan Wallace. Happy birthday to me. Oh. Who also seems to have a problem understanding patterns. He's a cop. He works late quite often sometimes. Occasionally this might happen to fall on your birthday. Don't take it fucking personal. 
Ah, oh, well, back with the investigation, it seems the angle on sin-based killings isn't even that important in this movie anyway, as most of the killings have already occurred, and the Preceptor is down to, like, two sins. Oh, yeah, he's been busy. Ah, oh, well, we can fill out the running time by reading some of the Preceptor's love letters and listening to Sean's very detailed knowledge of the meaning of the word. A precept is a teacher, responsible to uphold law or tradition, in this case, the Ten Commandments. The irony being that in order for these wacko serial killer movies to be marketable, they have to be teaching things that the general public already fucking knows. There's also questions thrown about as to why exactly Edgerton was assigned to the case, but the answers to that can wait. With the power of a speedy montage, they will surely catch the Perceptor before he can kill again! In about two seconds. Now 20% of the comments are going to be asking me to review Saw. Great. Have no fear, though. Our trio of super detectives are on the case. They find the hands and blood of four victims arranged in a disturbing display in a playground. But only if there was some clue as to why the Preceptor felt they needed to take these lives. Ha! <laughs> That's what I like in my detective movies. Clues about as subtle as lightsaber eye surgery. There's one more clue here. Another one to show that the holier-than-thou preceptor is still really shit at interpreting the Bible. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It means get even with even punishment. Just don't go around gouging out people's eyes and teeth. If they took your shit, take their shit. Or cut off their hands. But either way, the preceptor seemed to have missed that whole New Testament thing. Now we take a short break for Pinhead to relax in a chair. See? Pinhead's in this movie. Therefore, it is by definition Hellraiser. On with the actual story, David has a minor breakthrough with the case. Conveniently enough, involving only the victims we've actually seen. It seems all four of the victims in the latest killing went to the same school, and said school was the one that had a restraining order against the guy we saw get the fuck murdered out of him in the opening. Not only that, but Dog Lady also went to that school years ago. Somehow in this universe this counts as a connection, and they head over to Pervy McDead Guy's place to investigate. He's not in. That cocksucker owes me two months' rent. Hey, kids! It's Heather Langenkamp! Blink and you'll miss her. She's got a minor cameo appearance as a landlady for less than a minute, but still gets her name plastered all over this picture like this is some kind of major role for her. Either way, they gain entry and find a few suspicious articles in the apartment. Newspapers cataloging the Preceptor's crime spree, and also a strange old envelope. They decide to take it back to the station, run it through the lab, and see what they can find. Anything? Nope. Nothing! It's really making me feel great about spending this long watching all these assholes jerk off. Sean, though, figures there might be something more to find in Watkins' abode, so he heads back. In the lair of pedophilia, he takes a peek at the man's browser history. Oh dear god, why? Oh, uh, lucky for us, it just happens to be completely bare and spare search for a specific location. Rather than call us in and get a warrant, or at the very least document what the hell he found, Sean decides to go right the fuck over to the location in question. The mysterious doghouse from the opening. Excuse me, Detective Sean Carter? And he got instantly captured because... He got instantly captured. Now it's me, the movie never fucking explains it. It's the same basic interrogation they gave Mr. Watkins in the opening, but with a few twists. Sean here isn't a sniveling crybaby, and the auditor is actually pleasantly surprised by the small talk they have. Only God can judge me. And God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man. Ecclesiastes 317. Deuteronomy 21.9. Oh, oh, I like you. Maybe after we're done hanging your flesh from hooks on the ceiling, we can meet up later for a little chat. The auditor also kindly explains what the puzzle boxes are, how they're a link between worlds, and the place where Sean finds himself is not Earth. But that takes a backseat to the audit in question, where Sean confesses sin after sin and writes a motherfucking novel for the assessor to eat. Slight problem. As it turns out, it is a really bad idea to eat while this movie is on. Or the sin of Sean is so great, the man chokes on it, puking black, which overwhelms the jury. So as this has completely fucked up the chain of events that we're supposed to go through, the auditor says fuck it and sends the man off to the cleaners anyway. However, this is interrupted by the appearance of an angel, Jophiel, played by Helena Grace Donald. 
Yes, there are angels in the world of Hellraiser now. And they chatted up with the Cenobites, who are effectively demons. Never mind that bullshit. The point is, she demands they let Sean go free. I don't care. The jury never passed their verdict. You let him go, do you understand? Not really, no. Well, do you understand who is in charge? Well, considering he is the writer and director, I'd say he outranks you a tad. Despite this clear and direct order, we have to suffer through seeing the cleaners go to town on Sean anyway. Or rather, I had to suffer. I don't gotta show you this shit. I guess the only thing that's really of note here is, I guess that means that when they were making the movie, someone sat down and thought, hey, you know what the Hellraiser series really needs is inspiration from the human centipede. The point is, by the time the auditor returns to him, it turns out Sean has escaped, murdered the women, and stole a spare lament configuration on his way out. However, Pinhead, now played by Paul T. Taylor, who at the very least gives a performance worlds better than Stephen Smith Collins, even if he doesn't have that much screen time and spends most of it reclining in the chair, uh, I'm rambling. Point is, he's not worried. There's no need to go after him. He'll be back. After all, where else could the climax of this movie possibly take place? So Sean escapes the Cenobite's dimension by driving the fuck away, and the first thing he does is get in contact with his brother David. Not to tell him what's going on, but demand he comes with. And they drive right the fuck back to the house Sean was fleeing for his life from just moments earlier. Don't worry, it's perfectly safe. Look, the place is just your average ass abandoned house by the time they return, and Sean still doesn't bother explaining why the fuck he felt the need to bring David out here. This calls for some emotional blackmail. Allison is worried about you. Oh, you'd know that. Man, we're all worried about you, Sean. Except for Heather Langenkamp. She already cashed her check and went the fuck home. On that note, Sean goes the fuck home to sleep. However, he is tormented by nightmares of Cenobites! So his wife wakes him up and helps cheer the guy up with some fucking. However, he is tormented by nightmares of Cenobites! Thus he runs back out into the night where he decides to drown his sorrows in a handy dandy liquor bottle. However, he is tormented by nightmares of Cenobites! Well, while his life is on repeat, let's hop over to David and see that he is tormented by uncomfortable lines of questioning about his brother, his life after the war, his hang-ups, and possible substance abuse issues. He drank for a little while, but he is sober now. He drank all the booze, but now he's passed out an alley somewhere completely sober. At least he's not stuck in the interrogation for long, as a phone call provides an easy escape. Tell us. Hey, you. Yep, they're fucking. Now, I know in reality, having your brother's wife's phone number and being on friendly terms with them isn't really a cause for alarm, but in a movie? Oh, heh, they're fucking. Clearly. Three times a day. Point is, she says Sean's car broke down, and David has to go pick him up. Picking him up out of an alley, stinking of booze, kinda clues him in that things aren't quite so hunky-dory with the guy. But no matter David's questions about his brother's well-being, Sean dismisses them without much concern. No one is judging you. Like I told somebody else. Only God can judge me. Dude, film critic, part of the job description. I'll mark that down as another factual error. While Sean goes to wash up, David starts poking around at those books he's so obsessed with, which reveals certain lines were underlined and highlighted. It's almost like Sean knows his brother's a shit detective. Well, these lines match up kinda sorta with a note left by the serial killer, and that is odd, but not worth talking about past that for now. David can stick around the station looking over files, but Sean and Edgerton head down to the morgue to find out that the one victim, Crystal, happened to have her cell phone shoved down her throat while she was killed. Her cell phone with a location app running. So they know where she was killed, or at least where the cell phone's last location was recorded to be. If that's not ridiculously obvious enough that this is a trap, there are portraits of all the victims hung all over the place, and one is covered. Almost like they knew someone would be coming by. And the killer was Sean all along! It's kinda obvious, I mean, who the fuck else could it be? The only other character the movie kinda hinted around with a little red herring tease was Carl Watkins, who we saw killed in the opening, quite convincingly. But have no fear, David is on the case. Using the combined powers of Google and Wikipedia, he realized the one very common quote that Sean kept parroting all movie is kinda sorta related to something called something else that when put through Google Translate occasionally means Perceptor. Thus he knows his brother is the bad guy, but falls right into his trap anyway, showing up alone and ending up being held up by the guy who easily got his wife to come by as well. 
This is because he has to hurry up and remind the audience this is a Hellraiser movie, pulling out the puzzle box to force the two of them to open the door to the Cenobites' world at gunpoint. All this in some pitiful attempt to trade these two assholes for his own soul, which obviously doesn't work. When the surgeon and the butcher are finished with you, you will be reborn into an eternity of agony. What the fuck is going on? Shh, not now, Dave. The movie's trying to be Hellraiser-themed. To prevent further interruption, the adulterers are dragged off-screen for an eternity of torture themselves, before Pinhead attempts to give Sean the same, and is stopped by the angel of cock-blocking Jophiel. Sure, Sean is so very evil he choked the assessor, but hey, heaven kinda likes that shit running around on Earth. Keeps the peasants in line. Pinhead would rather he be punished forever starting now, but she insists he let him go. So... I'm back. It just gets fucking shot anyway. Forces of Heaven can meddle in the affairs of man and hell, but can't do shit when it comes to Smith and Wesson. She's not happy, to say the least, but Pinhead don't give a fuck. He'll torture her forever, too! Why not? Her threats of punishment don't mean shit to a Cenobite whose entire concept of pleasure is pain. What the fuck could she even do? The sweet suffering. The sweet suffering. She turned Pinhead into a human again! Which only makes sense as a punishment if you know what the Cenobites are according to Hellraiser lore, but the plot of the movie only makes sense if you don't know what the Cenobites are according to Hellraiser lore and just assume they're the forces of Hell. The end! Way to go, movie! Oh, but what's this? An after credit scene! Seems Mormons are spreading the good word in Germany, but darn those creepy horror houses the Cenobites have taken to using instead of puzzle boxes! True. And it is indeed on a Tuesday. So, the Cenobites were banished, but not banished. Half banished? Yeah, fuck it, the movie may as well not make sense there either. Anyway, that was Hellraiser Judgment. And it is a step up, but only because Revelations was a fucking hole in the ground. When it comes to any movie franchise, it seems to be a common belief that bad sequels tend to be bad in a straight line, continuously going downward. But as much as I can say Hellraiser Judgment is certainly not a good movie, and bring into question its merits as a Hellraiser movie, come on, Revelations was so bad on the barrel it would be downright impressive for another Hellraiser movie to be worse than that. Of course, you could probably tell from my incessant bitching and moaning that I wasn't the greatest fan of this movie either. It's a shame, because the trailer did make it look like it at least had some potential. Truth be told, there are good things here throughout the movie. The presentation is pretty high quality, giving the movie a very professional look, and the acting holds to that standard very well. It still sucks not having Doug Bradley to reprise his role as Pinhead, but at the very least, the new guy this time around did a good job. Or an okay job, and they just didn't have the screen time to make me hate him. Either way, I didn't hate him. What I did hate, though, is the mishmash plot and gross-out focus of the movie. The Cenobites are very much in the background of the events, and the mystery would have worked better had we not started out seeing the red herring being fucking carved up in the opening scene. This leaves the movie as a very basic murder mystery with a Cenobite subtext. Ish. It really could have been anything else, but it's a Hellraiser movie, so even when we write them to be Hellraiser movies from the start, why let that actually matter to the main course of events? Finally, the horror is... just... gross out. Well, there's spooky music and some psychological elements here and there, but rather than trying to give us something semi-spooky to leave us feeling uneasy, the movie just throws puke and drool and snot and the like in our faces to make us feel queasy. I know Frank being formed out of gore condensation in the first movie wasn't the cleanest scene, but at least it had purpose and was very impressive special effects. If you like your horror like The Human Centipede, where it's a challenge to watch the movie for what it's showing at the time, this could be up your alley. Not mine, though. At the end of the day, though, Hellraiser Judgment is a missed opportunity. The quality of the cinematography and the acting are worth noting as positives, and I did like the look of a few of the characters who we were introduced to. I'm not really a fan of random bouts of two girls, one cup. Uh, the big problem is the inconsistent nature of Cenobites, both compared to the earlier works of this franchise and within the fiction itself. Coming in at two confusing Chatterer cameos out of five. It's not good, but given the choice of watching this again or Revelations, I'd try to mate with a wood chipper. Thank you all for watching, I've been Decker Shadow, and remember, hyperbole is a thing.
this weirdo in the dark thing is only a turn on for like a few minutes. <laughs>